I would like you to turn in the last book of the Bible. It's Revelation, if you didn't, if you didn't know. Revelation, and let's turn to chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. And we'll begin here in verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lo as of a lion of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast, and they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying. Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here's the patience and faith of the saints. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. Thank you for the good hymns this morning. Thank you for everyone that's here, everyone that might be watching, everyone that may pick up a copy here sometime later. Uh, I just ask that I don't get in, in your way and that everyone can see past the limitations uh, of the speaker and that the Holy Spirit would uh, make up the difference, and that I could say things that you would say if you were here. I know that's impossible, but I pray I come close, and that your will might be accomplished in each and every one of us. We are, no question, living in perilous times, and we, we need to have the same confidence we have in our salvation about what's going on and not be uh, doubtful and, and, and sometimes even in chaos as to what's, what's happening. So if there's any among us without Christ, I just pray that they would listen to much of what can be historical, uh, the other prophetical, and make a wise decision that if they, if they fail here, if they fail to, to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ came for them and died for them and shed his blood for them and, and was buried for them and rose again for them, then in all likelihood there would be no repentance. And, and the result of that, there'd be no faith in him as, as their savior. They would find no need. So I pray that there's, there's no one here like that. But if there is, that the Holy Spirit would bring that needed conviction, that they would come to see that they need to be saved and to do it now. So have your way in what we do here to, <clears throat> this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So uh, my desire, Lord willing, is to take chapter 13. Uh, at first I was going to do the whole chapter, and then I said that's impossible. And there's really an impossibility with taking 10 verses and, and getting everything that, that I really want to get, but then divide it into two messages, and then uh, next Sunday night uh, do the other. Now, all of that can change, uh, but that's what I hope to do. 
So we're going to deal with a lot of things that have not happened yet. And none of you have seen Christ in the flesh. And many of you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, having never seen him because of what you've read in Scripture. And so now we're going to ask that you believe the things that are written here prophetically, though they have not happened yet, and base what is going to happen on the past when we can go all the way back before the Babylonian kingdom and go to each world ruling power and how they came to fruition just as the word of God said. And that, that, so that's important. So we, we're going to deal with people that have, may or may not be on the scene as yet. Uh, but we are, we are here awaiting the Lord's return for us. And the moment that he does, then the program we're going to talk about is going to kick into high gear. Things are happening very fast today, faster than that I probably anticipated. But now I can see how much quicker everything's going to happen once the believers are gone. So I'm going to start off with a quote. <clears throat> the streets of our country are in turmoil. The universities are full of students rebelling and rioting. Communists are seeking to destroy our country, and the republic is in danger. And yes, danger from within, but also danger from without. We need law and order. Without law and order, our nation cannot survive." Unquote. Anybody think this was President Nixon? How about President Kennedy? Or we could say President Trump. Or maybe they were the fanatics that go to these liberal colleges and, uh, and rioted even back in the late 60s and the, and the 80s. It's kind of a tough selection. But in actuality, these were, these were said in 1932. So that eliminates every name I mentioned and brings one clear name, Adolf Hitler. Very interesting, the words he said and the words we're hearing said today. All right, so uh, dictators rarely come to power by brutality and force. Putin, of course, is an exception. Uh, there are some that have, but he's a current uh, exception. Usually it's political problems and economic problems. Uh, set the stage for a dictator to come on the scene and overthrow everything. So <clears throat> during his day, Hitler's day, Germany, uh, Germany's economy was in the gutter. Citizens were starving. Inflation was, was reaching no end point, And communities were in, in dire straits. Communists were stirring up stuff, strife on university campuses, and then really the country was on the verge of collapse. And no politician, no, no, uh, nobody from the clergy was able to create any order out of the confusion. And then he appears, Hitler, a voice of authority in the midst of chaos. And he became, over time, viewed as a savior. Because the rioting stopped, men were going back to work, and people were eating. And there became a new sense of spiritual, not spiritual, national pride in Germany. So all of us that were fortunate enough to grow up and study unrevised and unredacted history know the final results. I pity the, I pity the kids in government schools today for what they're taught about our American history or, or national history, because many of it's different. So anyway, admiration turned to worship, as it does in many generations, and especially in religion, sometimes in sports as well. And so Hitler turned out to be possessed by devils, uh, a classic a classic ghoul in the old terminology, or monster if you're squeamish. Uh, ghoul is a better, 
is a better word, actually. And so Hitler called for a cleansing of the Jews. Today, the swamp in Washington, D.C., and the mainline liberal media, uh, far-left universities, and even religions are calling for a cleansing of Trump voters or supporters. I don't think that's by coincidence. I think, I think we're on the verge of history repeating itself. So what I've decided to do uh, here this morning is talk about what Hollywood talks about all the time, but in, in the reality sense, they, they project superheroes before the faces of their viewers, and they've been doing that for more than decades now. Well, the real life, real life tells the truth. So in the first 10 verses, which we read, it tells us of, the, of an Antichrist, the Antichrist, the final worldwide dictator or empire. He will be Satan's superhero. Beyond question, he is called the beast out of the sea. Now, if you've grown up with evolution, you know that the evolution teaches that we've all come from beasts. And, and the world that we know is heading back that way with that current of a belief. It's strange. So there's five things that I want to look at. Usually I don't list those because when I get to number four, then you'll know on number five he's going to quit real quick. No. Uh, five things, okay? Verse 1, chapter 13. We're introduced to the dictatorship of the beast. And I stood upon the sea, the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads <clears throat> the name of blasphemy. So the sea represents something here. So I want you to hold your place here in Revelation. Go back to Isaiah chapter 17. Isaiah chapter 17. And then we'll look at the one in Revelation here as soon as we're done. Isaiah chapter 17. And let's look here in verse 12. 17 verse 12. Woe to the multitude of many people which make a noise like the noise of the seas. And to the rushing of nations, they make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. Okay, keep that in mind. Go to chapter 17 of Revelation. And look at verse 15. Revelation 7, 17, 15. And he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So the sea that he rises up out of represents all of humanity, uh, the nations of the world, that it will be in existence at that time. During the tribulation, they will be, and of course, nations are made up of people, in mass confusion and turmoil. And now, don't forget what's already, what already had, would have happened by chapter 13, you had water turned to blood, fresh water poisoned, uh, worldwide famine, chaos, and an enormous loss of human life. And then one man comes on the scene and makes it all better, or at least so it seems. It would be the rider on the, what kind of horse? White horse in Revelation 6. And, and, and I think if we would be honest, the world is looking everywhere for someone to come and change things, uh, make, make things better, to, to look for peace. And the beast will rise up out of the sea of mankind. And in the earlier centuries, uh, leaders, uh, world leaders were, were demanded to be worshiped. Uh, I'll start with uh, the uh, the Caesars first here. I'll go to some later on. Um, but they were regarded by, its, by the citizens to be God. And if not, then they were killed if they could be found out. So we've got the, the dictatorship of the beast revealed. 
in verses 1 and 2, again of chapter 13. I'll just read verse 2 since I did the other one. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were the feet as of were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and with the, with the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. We have a description of the beast. Now, if there was ever a child of the devil, here he is. His ancestry traces back to Lucifer in Isaiah 14. And Christ's words to the Pharisee in John chapter 8, verse 44, are appropriate for this coming dictator. Ye are of your father, the devil. And he will be that. No question of that. There is a family likeness in verse 3. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And go down here to verse uh, Forgot, I didn't have the right verse. I'll do, I, can, I can do this with verse 3. It's okay. The Antichrist will be able to say, as the Lord Jesus Christ said in John 14, 9, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Now, we know that Christ is the visible expression of the invisible Father. God manifests in the flesh. In this time... The Antichrist will be the, vis the visible expression of the invisible devil. And people will believe, will believe the opposite, but this is who he is. There are seven heads, or speaking of seven mountains. In chapter 17, we have a clue to where that is. Revelation 17, verse 9. And here is the mind which hath wisdom, the seven heads or seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. The, the common thought has always been that that has been Rome. Uh, we could probably extend that to Vatican City, which is its own country. Nowadays, back then it wasn't a country. So we know, we know exactly where this is going to be. The city, uh, the ten crowns in verse 1, represent the same thing as the ten toes in... Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's golden statue that he built, more, more than likely of the revival of the, of the Roman Empire in Europe. And speaking of Europe, and, and today, uh, watch out for what's going on there, and especially NATO. This, this, this thing with Russia coming in so -called, has so-called united NATO but it has escalated one nation in NATO above the others, and that is Germany. And that's dangerous, because we know that later on, there, is, there are several nations coming down from Russia to attack Israel. Gomer is probably Israel, I mean uh, Germany. So you have to keep that in mind. And so, they have the euro, the united money, the one, one currency. Um, and so I might as well get this out of the way. Many people, and I've been reading this, I hate being on the internet, um, but it felt it was necessary. There are many people misleading people to think that we are entering into Ezekiel 38 and 39. I, do, I, I just don't hold that that happens before we're out of here. Uh, if, it, if it's not and, and it's going to happen now, then we are quite some way away from the rapture. Especially when you look at what's going on right now with Ukraine. This was not expected from Russia to take this long. I mean, it still may be devastating. It mills, they may annihilate everybody there, but... Uh, they're one of the six nations coming down. So you've got to keep that in mind. All right, his family lineage, you see the leopard, the bear, the lion. Um, Daniel chapter 7, if you, let's turn there if you would, Daniel chapter 7. 
I know I'm, I'm skipping over a lot of things, and not taking them and expanding on these, but I want to try to get through these. And this should, I hope, whet your appetite for the study that we do here. So Daniel chapter 7, let me get there. And we'll read here in verse 1. Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of England, yeah, right. King of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw it in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea, and the four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first beast was like a lion and had eagle's wings, and I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and the man's heart was given to it. Behold, a, another beast of second, like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it, and they said thus unto it, Rise, devour much flesh. And after this, I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceeding, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. It was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So you see the lion, you have the, the bear, the leopard. They're all, they're all tied together as, as the Antichrist comes and really puts all of these together in one person. So that would include, if we go through history, it would include what I spoke about, the, the Caesars, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Darius, Cyrus, Alexander the Great, um, Napoleon, Stalin, Marx, Lenin, Mussolini, Mao Zedong, um, Hussein, Saddam Hussein, all of that lumped into one person. It's hard to imagine. And each, each one in its own individuality was horrible. But put all those together in one, and you, you can hopefully see the, the magnitude of what we're dealing with here. So then we see the family legacy in chapter 13, verse 2. And it talks about the dragon giving him his power and seat and great authority. In, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, if you turn there, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So the, the dragon gives him his power if he's alive today. Why isn't he revealing himself and taking over? I mean, we've got chaos in a lot of places today. We had it for the last two years with an invisible virus. Then what happened to the invisible virus? What happened to, what happened to the necessity, the, the mandate that you had to wear a mask? And the vaccines now? What's happened to all that? We, like Fauci is useless anymore. So now we've got to move on to something else. And so the dragon's going to give him his power. And you look here in verse 6, 2 Thessalonians 2, 6. And now you know what, with, what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery and iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. So has, a lot of this has to do with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit oh, holding that. And I believe he holds it through us. And once we're gone, all of this really breaks loose. All right, here's the third thing. In verse 3, 
You see the desirability of the beast. Verse 3. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the, the beast. So verse 3 seems to be very, that he's going to be very popular. Number one, because of the false peace he brought, turning economies over, even if only briefly, because we know how that ends. But then comes this mortal wound that verse 3 talks about. And the mortal wound is, ver is mentioned in verse 12. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And then verse 14, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by, by a sword and did live. So this has to be important if it's mentioned three times in a chapter, and it has to be something to do with the imitation of the Lord Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. It has to. So whether the, if whether the, the reality of that you really died is, is not the issue. The issue is that it's going to be imitated very clearly. And, and you see, the, all the world wondered after the beast. There, there, there are two possibilities, great fear or great popularity. I kind of put both of them together. Now, don't get off base because he's called a beast. The beast is a reference to his character, not his appearance. So go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And you find here in chapter 11, in verse 13, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. <clears throat> Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So Satan and his devils here are angels of light. They, they appear, they are, in many pulpits of churches in the world today. And institutions, higher learning, and seminaries. They don't parade as being possessed by devils. They parade as angels of light, of righteousness. But they're not any more than the beast is. So that's a, he's a master conf, uh, counterfeit. In Isaiah 14, I will be like the Most High. So do, we, do you have any examples of that? What about in Matthew 13, when the tares were introduced into the wheat? And you couldn't tell the tares from the wheat uh, initially. Uh, you, what you had is you had profession without possession, but eventually you were able to tell the difference. Or Matthew chapter 25 with the ten virgins, all of them had lamps, but only five had oil. So, I mean, these, I think these are, these are important that we understand. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, Paul marveled that the Galatian believers were taken by the Judaizers after he left. And after he left, they came down and they said, you know what, we, we believe just like you believe. And Paul was right, but he didn't go far enough. You, you need to be circumcised and you need to follow the ceremonial law. And once you do that, then you'll, then you'll believe. And so Paul was saying, why, did, why have you believed another gospel that's not the real gospel? Why, why have you done that? How could it have happened so quickly? 
because see these people came in they assimilated into the church once they were a part of the group then they began to do that they didn't come suppose a, a, a jehovah witness comes up to you at the door i'm a jehovah witness i don't believe that jesus is god and 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 he just goes through this litany of things that that he doesn't believe that the bible affirms you wouldn't you wouldn't spend a second with him but they don't they don't do that they they unload on you current events and by unloading on current events they want you to agree with them on something and you've got to have a strong will to say we're not going to deal with current events we're going to deal with the bible in, in specific verses so anyway these are these are things that you know the devil works through people like this all right number four is the determination of the beast in verse four of uh, revelation chapter 13 the determination of the beast verse four and they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast and they worship the beast saying who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him all right if you hold your place here go to second thessalonians chapter 2 i'll make a brief reference to here Second Thessalonians chapter two. And we'll look here in verse three and then verse four. Let no man deceive you by any means that that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshiped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The first thing that you see here, he's, he's coming to deify himself. Lots of examples. Jim Jones. David Koresh. Even, even uh, Lenin. Lenin has a casket. And I think it's Moscow Square. And people have to go by and they have to have reverence to a casket with supposedly a, a god in there. It's crazy. When we were at the Vatican way back, we, uh, it was the day of, of 35 millimeter camera. So you had the film and uh, so we went in and they have a big statue of Peter and he's sitting in a chair. It's grotesque. And, and the Catholic people would go in and they would kiss his toe. And they would kiss his toe so much that they have to cordon it off and then rebuild his toe. It's a dumb knee. And they, they say, you can't take any pair. I took a picture. I hadn't, I hadn't taken two breaths. And security was on me and said, well, I want your film. It was a good picture. Now you have cell phones. You can take all the pictures you want. They wouldn't even know. But, it, but everybody was going through. And, and again, this has to do with the, de, 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 the deifying of something that, that is beyond man. Uh, and to defy God in verse 5 and in verse 6. Given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and then that dwell in heaven. So you see a lot of similarity with Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, so he wants to defy God. A master of words, fair speeches, very slippery. And yet hates us. Hates believers. Hates Jews. And will convince the world that the reason we are gone, I'm making this up, this is just me, is because we're punished. We were punished for some reason. That's why we're all gone. Blasphemy will spew out of his mouth like garbage. 
All right, verse 7, his purpose to destroy the saints. And then it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power is given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Daniel speaks of, of uh, policies will try to wear out the saints of the Most High in Daniel 7.25. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, as we continue reading 8 through 12, there's a, there's a section there where I'm not covering, but you need to read, especially if you're doubtful of your salvation, especially if you're sitting here lost and thinking it doesn't matter, what happens to you if you put it off? That the blindness will occur so great. And this is where, uh, you know, we, we, we do tend to deal in sensationalism if we're not careful, where people will be so blind that when the Lord takes us, there's not going to, I don't believe there's going to be a lot of concern. Oh, he's gone or she's gone or a couple of them are gone. You know, you see the, the, the pictures of planes falling out of the air and trains crashing and things like that. Maybe to some degree, for, but for the most part, blindness. Because people re rejected the truth when they had the chance to, to receive it. In verse 11, we see his agent of deception. And I beheld another beast coming out, up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. All right, this, has to, this is his comrade. Uh, this, is the, this is the guy that works hand in hand. This is a false prophet. And I'll say much more about that on the, other, on the next message. Okay, this is a true story. 1938, in the United States, a man lived, on, in, uh, in, lived in Long Island, New York. He didn't know where that was. And uh, for whatever particular reason, wanted a barometer. And he wanted the barometer to sit on his fireplace. So he w ordered a decorative one. And eventually it was delivered. And he uh, unpacked it and he set it on the mantel, mantel and stood back. And, He's very glad to see that he now had the barometer. Looked very official, great touch to the living room. And so he checked it out very carefully to ensure that it was working properly. And if you're familiar with barometers, the dial was, I don't know if it was left or right, I think it was left. And it said a storm was coming. And he just turned on the radio, weather report. They didn't do percentages back then. It's going to be a sunny day in New York. And no, no rain today. That was, that was the weather forecast. So he had to go to work. And he was upset because now he thought he bought a broken barometer. And at, at work, uh, how, well, actually, he felt dumb because he felt he, f he fell for an ad which assured accuracy. So as the day progressed, a 30-foot bank of wind locked in with fog and produced a storm surge of 30 to 50 feet. The sun, the sun disappeared into the clouds. It was rainy, the wind picked up. And then at the office that he worked, the, the manager said, you, you got, everybody needs to get home as quickly as you can. So the man who bought the barometer was still seething over buying something that he thought was broken paying no attention to the coming of st storm. I think he rode the train home. But all the time, he, his mind is focused on the barometer. Traffic was horrible. The, the trains were packed, and the wind increased, and the rain was coming sideways. Man 
wanted to get home with one, one focus. I'm going to take that, that, that barometer and throw it out. Well, no worries. When he got to where his house was, the barometer was gone and, and three quarters of his house was gone. It's called the Great Hurricane of Long Island and Southern New England. It was a Category 5 as it came up the coast and entered as a Category 3. One of the worst hurricanes to hit that area ever. A lot of lost lives. You know what? There was nothing wrong with the barometer. Nothing at all. It didn't need adjusting. It didn't need repair. It simply needed believing. That's it. God's word tells us that there's coming a spiritual judgment on our earth. There's coming a spiritual judgment to us. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. And look here. <clears throat> Hebrews 9 and, and look in verse 27. 9 verse 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. You and I, if the Lord tarries his coming, all have a reservation with death. It is appointed unto a man once to die, and after that the judgment. And so, as, as the word was going forth today, Understand, there is a spiritual judgment coming upon all of us in one way or another, accompanied by a physical judgment on the entire earth in the tribulation. And as, as bad as the tribulation is going to be, and I don't, want to, I don't want to try to minimize how bad it is, that well over half the population of the known world will be dead. The second death will be much worse than the physical death. Because you'll be eternally separated from the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, first in hell and then eventually into the lake of fire uh, forever. This book, this King James Version that you, that you hold in your laps, that you, that you have at home, has been preserved by God for us as, as English speaking people. It also does not need adjusting or revision. It is accurate. It is totally accurate. It merely needs to be believed. Everything I've told you here is coming to pass. Everything. A lot of the details I don't have, a lot of the details we can't give. But what we do have is that the Lord Jesus Christ came for us. He sought to seek and to save that which was lost. That was me. You. And he came to give his life for me and you. And he did that in a sinless way. If he was not sinless, he could not die for me. He would be no different than me. And so he had to be sinless. And his blood was perfect. And he shed that for us. And it paid the price of my sin, your sin, in full. I mean, this is a long, long time ago that he did that, and it's, and it's still there. Okay, and he, and he died, and he, and he resurrected again the third day, and he offers salvation through him and him alone. And if you don't come his way, there is no way for you ever to be saved. So imagine that you live in a house and your, your house is completely gated. And at the entrance to your house is, is a double gate with a sign on it. And then there's another entrance over here without a sign on it. And the sign on the front door entrance, the double gate, says, warning, bad dog which is legal tender today. If you put up any other sign about it, your dog, you can be sued. That is legal. 
right? Warning, bad dog. And so you decide, I don't see any dog. And so you just walk in, you walk down the sidewalk, and guess what? Here comes this dog, and he tears you up. And you're mad. What are you mad at? You had a warning. The warning was warning, bad dog. Well, listen, you die in your sins. Nobody's going to pay it after that except you, except you can't ever pay it in full. Christ already paid it. And so he, he offers you a salvation by grace through faith, apart from any works. He always has. He always will. And, and when we come that way, then we have the assurance that we are, in fact, his child through faith in Christ. And we will not, as far as I'm concerned, be in the tribulation. I don't, I don't think there's going to be big screens in heaven for us to watch the tribulation. If you're that kind of a person, I think we'll be occupied with serving him far more than we will looking down here. But we'll be, we'll be free from this. So maybe this is the last time you hear that message. Maybe this is the last time you hear that gospel. Maybe. And if you're, if you're a, gam a spiritual gambler, you know what you're going to do? Huh. Who's he to say that? I'm a nobody. I'm telling you about somebody here that keeps his word. And if you don't trust the Lord that it's your Savior and you die in that condition, you don't get second chances. You don't go to places that don't exist. You go to hell. And if you want to find out what hell is like right now, Luke chapter 19, I mean 16, 19 through 31. And if you want to know what it's like in the lake of fire, you don't want to know. The devil and the, and the false prophet are going to be cast into that. And all liars, and that there's a list that goes on. And uh, know that whatever happens in hell will be probably a picnic compared to lake of fire. Forever. And I, I'm as serious as, it, as it's humanly possible. We have seen some things over the course of not only this ministry, but other ministries that scare us and think, make us realize not everything is the way it appears. Not everyone is the way they appear. And you need to make sure, you need to examine yourselves and make sure you are who you say you are. Because then you will follow what the scripture says. But you have this chance. Why would you, why would you not take it? You have the chance if you've been saved and to identify with the Lord Jesus Christ in his baptism. Nothing to do with being saved. Everything to do with identification and his death down into the water, burial, and coming up, resurrection. And people that are, that are visiting, not members, have the, the, the opportunity to come, make the intent that they want to join in with this local church. Again, I'm going to say this, and I'm saying this, I hope I'm not saying it out of frustration. What are you waiting for? I don't, I don't get it. When you read through, everything you read through in the New Testament, it all focuses on... On, on Jesus Christ. But then the church came on the scene. Remember that? And Paul went out. What did he do? He went out three times. What did he do? Did he establish hospitals? Did he build colleges? Did he go out and, and you know do medical ministry? No, it was spiritual. And he would win people to Christ. Then he would bring them in and they'd start a church. And those people grew and they would go out. And the, whole, the whole focus of the missions has been turned on its head. We're people that should be counting our blessings that were saved and going out and telling other people about what we have in order to possibly bring them in 
so that they can, they can be saved and grow and go out and bring others in. And if we're not doing that, what, again, this may be, again, the last, the last message you ever hear. So whatever, whatever's going on, and I hope something's going on in your heart, let's deal with it in the invitation. Okay, let's pray. Our Father, we <clears throat> come before you, and we, we ask you to, to move in our behalf, to do what you know you want us to do. It is your will that all men be saved. It is your will that none perish, but that everyone repents. And yet, there are some that can sit all the time and not be moved. I can't move them. Only you can. So I ask you to move upon them. There's others of us that have gone through rough times, gone through things where, like we were speaking about in Sunday school, that things become stagnant. And Father, only we can change that. Only we. It's not going to come from outside. It's going to come from inside, right here, within us, each and every one. And I'm grateful for what we, 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 we accomplish. But I know we can accomplish more. But it takes every one of us. We need to pray for each other. We need to be involved with each other, for sure. So speak to our heart here this morning. Have your way in the invitation. And we'll thank you for it. For we pray this in Jesus' name.